Hello and welcome. draw on it you can't draw on the hands that's right and that's a perfect way to open the show you can't draw on your hands i guess you can uh we have david newland on the show welcome to the show david it's so great to have you thanks um and just before the show we were talking about all kinds of interesting things you played an open mic up at uh chippewas and awash they had a big uh, drone sort of show the drone show yeah uh and you're you're also not just a singer or songwriter but you're also a radio show host that's true and then you mc snuff and then congratulations recently on your masters thank you and that was from trent that's right masters from trent and now i'm doing a phd at trent i just kept going wow okay <laughs> so a phd so you, one day you'll be dr newland that is the hope okay right? that's Great. you know i don't want to put the cart before the horse right uh, uh, there's four or five years between okay. this moment where I've just started and uh, and arriving at that stage. But I hope so. Yeah. Okay. And what was the, uh, I guess, the love, our pursuit of academics? You're just really into like lifelong learning or this is a goal you always have? a really good question. Honestly, in all honesty, Mark, it's a pandemic pivot. Um, okay. You know, uh, I had been, I've always worked in the arts and media. I, my, my undergrad was in photography, but I was always writing and playing music on the side. I went into, uh, you know, when the internet came along, I became a writer and producer for various websites. I worked at Discovery Channel for five years and mm -hmm. CBC, Canoe.ca, McLean's. And um, it would, uh, just seemed to be the best kind of day job for me to have because it combined all these different elements, you know, the visual and the audio and the writing and so on. And I, and I always had a steady uh, kind of side gig, if you will, in folk music, sometimes more, sometimes less. Mm. Uh, sometimes I took time off and did mostly just that for a while. Right. And then uh, I wound up spending about uh, seven years at a company called Adventure Canada mm -hmm. that does expedition ship-based travel, mostly mm -hmm. in the Canadian Arctic, but I've been all across the North Atlantic and down the coast and so on. Okay. And that was a great thing to do because I, it, it inspired my music. It got me whole new audiences. I, I got a great kind of second phase, if you will, as a singer-songwriter mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, and just around the time the pandemic hit, it turned out to not be the greatest thing to be doing, right? Right, right, uh, right. Travel to the Arctic was totally cut off. Travel by ships was totally mm -hmm. cut off. Events were totally cut off and music was totally cut off. So all mm. the things I did were not right, right, happening. Right. And uh, I wound up, you know, I waited it out for a while. Um, my wife and I were having a, a new baby and, uh, you know, there was a kind of a layoff period while we all hoped things would come back, but they didn't. Mm. So when that ended, um, I decided to go back to school. And Trent has this really interesting program in English, brackets, public texts hmm. uh, so it's considering literature beyond the bounds of the the book the oh. poem or the play okay right and that was cool for me because i'd been a writer for 25 30 years at that point mostly online okay and um so i did that and you can do that program in one year i did a, what's called a major research project uh and you you just put the boots to it for for one year and uh, you write this huge paper, okay. and if you're, you know, you get all your ducks in a row and sure. do a good job, you get a master's, and and I did. Okay. So, um, so what do you mean by what do you mean by I guess examining sort of the material, the text beyond the book or beyond the play? Um, yeah. Maybe elaborate more on what that means. No, it's so, a great question. Yeah. I think there was in the digital era. First of all, there's been this realization that actually people are reading all the time. And some of them are never reading a book, right. right? Moreover, you can be writing all the time and never writing on paper. I mean, yeah. I've been published in newspapers and magazines and that kind of thing, but most of what I wrote was published online. Someone pressed publish. Like, it right. didn't go through a press or anything. Right, right, right. And so there's that aspect. Uh, but there's also the aspect, and this was what was interesting to me, is that mm, storytelling, if you will takes many many forms and so i was interested in um the kinds of storytelling endeavors by which 
the Canadian mythos is established mm-hmm. or perpetuated mm. with all of its problems, right? And what I ended up doing was um, I, uh, I, I took on George Brown, who is one of the fathers of Confederation, famous mm-hmm. for having George Brown College right, that's right, named yeah. after him. He was the founder and publisher of The Globe. And he was the main, you know, McDonald gets a lot of fame and credit and others, but Brown is the guy who kind of authors the vision of Canada that problematically still is in existence. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he wrote this huge uh, editorial on on the 1st of July, 1867. He goes into his office at midnight and writes all night this massive editorial. I'm showing him doing this, but I don't. I think he probably wrote by hand. And that's then right, someone, right. That's right. <laughs> someone set, uh, you know, set the whole thing to to type. But but what what Brown did then is he he writes this. It's a nine thousand word editorial followed by about another nine or ten thousand words of facts and statistics that are d- intended to demonstrate to tell the story of what is Canada, what's Canada going to be. And it's, it's a remarkable document. It's quite visionary in a sense. And it's also super mm. problematic, right? Mm. Uh, because all the issues that we now face today, you know, first of all, in erasure, almost total erasure of indigenous mm. presence, but also complete ignorance or, or sub, uh, you know, submersion of treaties and treaty rights, uh, mm. you know, which he knew better, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there, he, you know, he's one of the architects of confederation. Mm-hmm. He knows. Um, there's that kind of aspect, but there's, but there's also this aspect of kind of manifest destiny in mm-hmm. the thing. So everybody thinks that that's an American notion. Uh, and in fact, it's the American manifest destiny is one of the excuses for colonizing more of Canada, mm, because right. there's this kind of deal mm. like, oh, if we don't do this, the Americans are going to grab it all. Right, right, right. Well, what they're going to grab, of course, is indigenous territory. Right, right, right. right. Um, so anyway, I thought that was really interesting mm. that, that that newspaper editorial amounts to a story, a myth. And by myth, I mean a story that we live by. I'm not saying it's factual or not factual. That's not the idea. It's simply Brown authors this story that for people to aspire to then, and they still live by it now. Mm. So many of the things he says you could find in a newspaper today right. and it would still say that with right. all the same errors right? right right so how do we or as a student i guess uh dissect like the egocentric view uh, of history written by the victors so yeah how do we know what's uh what's real and what's not it's a great question what i what i decided to do was maybe a different take on it i'm you know there's a thread to this story that I haven't told, which is how that newspaper came to me. I have a physical copy of that newspaper. Oh, really? Okay. Which was found in the attic of a family home here in Toronto that my family lived in f- for five generations. I was the fifth generation. Uh, I didn't even know all that growing up, but I moved to Toronto when I was 27, moved in with my uncle who was trying to fix it up to sell it, and then... You know, I knew my dad and he had grown up there, but I didn't know the story. Well, it, it right. turned out, you know, um, my grandfather's grandfather built that little row house, 15 feet wide in the East End, and they lived there ever since. And somehow this newspaper was in the attic. And that was really interesting to me um, that it kind of came down to me hmm. that way um, from, you know, effectively someone who was a contemporary mm-hmm. of George Brown. Um, and so, and the other layer to this is that whole story is a kind of, is a part of my journey that I didn't know about because my dad didn't tell his stories because Mm -hmm. they were, they were poor and they, Mm -hmm. they didn't have a lot going on. And he was sort of the first to get out of the neighborhood type thing and do well. And I I think he, he didn't feel proud about those stories. Mm -hmm. And then there's yet another layer, which, you know, my dad is my adoptive dad. Mm. So I, I I have a biological family that I don't know very much about. And then an adoptive family, which I sort of received all my mom's stories, not my dad's, until uh, this moment in my life where 
I'm going through crisis, divorce, trying to figure it all out. And I land in this house. Okay. And there's my father's oh. untold story to welcome me, right? Wow. So interesting. And I think it's interesting anyway. Of course, no, it's no, interesting totally. for me. Yeah, yeah for sure, yeah. Because it's so, almost like there's no such thing as coincidence then. Like, you know, that old saying. That's how it feels, And that was yeah. meant to happen for you at that for me, specific yeah. part of the time, right? Yeah. And so in going at George Brown, I have these issues because right around the time that this paper comes into my life, I'm also making my first contact with my birth father. Mm. And uh, and it's not an entirely positive experience. He's not an entirely positive person. Um, and we decide not to stay in touch. Um, grateful for the encounter and everything, but it's like a bad timing for me to get involved with someone who has the kind of issues he's dealing with and, and just certain things that don't fit. And then he dies a few years later. And I don't find out about that until he's already been dead for some time. So looking back on this sort of 20 years down the road and still thinking about this newspaper and how it came to me and what it represents, I realized that one of the interesting things about it is that I get this, this artifact from a quote unquote father of confederation mm. right around the time that I'm figuring out my relationship to my adoptive father, the only father I've ever known, and his sort of untold stories, and I'm trying to put together the stories of this, this you know, ambivalent relationship with a birth father that I never knew. Mm. So fatherhood becomes a thing. And somehow I felt like that had to be in the picture. I didn't want to just be an academic, right. uh, you know, looking at this thing and, 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 and taking it apart. I wanted to be honest about how these threads are moving in me because mm-hmm. they're they're affecting my response, right? So what I did, there's this there's this I've seen encouragement numerous times from indigenous spaces saying like settlers got to connect with their ancestors, right? Mm. And this is a part of that in a way. Mm-hmm. Um and I've also seen this expression many times in, in many different sort of political spaces saying, try to call people in rather than out. Right. And so those things came together for me. And I went, you know what I think I need to do is call this ancestor in. Mm. Like he's a father of confederation. Right. Uh, and this thread somehow, like my feelings around him are, are really mixed up with both my earthly fathers mm-hmm. somehow right and um and i need this ancestor even though i see a lot of disagreement here you know sure. uh his views are are toxic to me on a lot of stuff and in other stuff he's quite admirable i mean he was a he was a prominent anti-abolitionist hmm. right okay no sorry he's a prominent abolitionist Abol- okay he's right. anti-slavery that's right anti-slavery very right, right, right. <laughs> publicly prominently right. Right, anti-slavery right. at a time when that would have come at a cost and so sure. on um so anyway what i did mark ultimately is i wrote a letter to george brown oh. uh about a thirty-six thousand word letter okay that looks at the issues that I, as a kind of distant son of Confederation, am having to deal with on the basis of this this document, this movement, this idea that he was a, a prime mover of, which is the idea of Canada, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's that's what I did. Okay. I can't remember how we went down that trail. But I think it was about uh, public texts. And, That's right. And, and, and yeah, so the Globe is a very prominent public text. Mm-hmm. But there's also this kind of meta text, right? Which mm-hmm. is the, the, the Canada is uh, notional more than it's actual, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and so I, I think that's hard for a lot of people to hear. And, um, it's been hard for me to address my relationship to a place that I have always felt profoundly about, not always positively about, right, right, but, right. I, but my feelings about it are strong, right? right? Um, and one thing that has been useful for me 
to deal with that stuff as a as a as a settler Canadian who wishes for better than what we're seeing, mm-hmm. what we have seen historically, mm-hmm. is to figure out well where did this come from? What 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 is it founded on? And I proposed that it's a paper nation, and mm-hmm. that that there's a play on words there. It's a nation that's written on paper, right? And it's also written in this newspaper, right? Um, and that there's a really interesting relationship there that I could go into, um, but the but the bottom line is that the nation state itself, not just Canada, but all the nation states, um, many uh, historians feel that they arise because of paper, because of the printing press, hmm. basically. Right, right, right. Polities are reformed around written language right. because of the promulgation of print. Right. Okay. Combined with the Protestant Reformation and capitalism, you basically have a new product that's massively uh, replicable that can go everywhere and disseminate mm. and form new communities. Right. Because before they don't care. You're German. You don't care who else is German. You right. you owe your allegiance to this duke or this king. He might be a Spaniard. He might be uh, Hungarian. There, all those royalties are moving the pieces around the chessboard. Right, right. You don't have a loyalty to a nation. You have a feudal loyalty or a tribal loyalty or a, or a um, a loyalty around a smaller place that maybe an empire hmm. is overseeing. Right. But you're not necessarily. This is the this is the proposal. You're not necessarily. Sure. And this is not me. This is Benedict Anderson, a historian, um, an economist. But uh, but I found it compelling. I hmm. found this idea compelling um, that that the printing press enables this kind of authorship of what Anderson calls imagined communities, and right. Canada is one of them. Right. It's an imagined community it doesn't have geographic cohesion we admit that no right? for sure and that's absolutely correct <laughs> big time um and but it but it also doesn't have a, a kind of uh, philosophical cohesion no no um it doesn't have a, a sort of a collectively shared uh spirituality yeah not at all uh, no, all, no, all no, these right things um and so that's really interesting because it gave me the the, the point of view um First of all, I, I'd like to sort of deconstruct this idea, and, and not, not to abolish it, but like let's look what we're sure. acting on here sure. and why. But secondarily, because it allowed me to to involve myself in and engage with indigenous notions of nationhood, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I, I that that's something I think that's really pressing for a lot of people, you know. A, a government was elected seven years ago that promised nation to nation relationships, which was an, an impossible promise if you hold the paper nation as your view That's right. of a nation, because you're you're going to have a completely asymmetrical, um, you know, relationship mm-hmm. if you can have one at all. And I think philosophically, it's a problem, right? Sure. And sure. and but my hope is that. Um, by sort of revealing the weaknesses of that that Canadian paper nation proposal, that you can you can kind of scratch away and look underneath and go, but, but you know what? There, there's all these existing nations here, and through through those relationships, there's a whole new possibility, hmm. right? Right, right, right. Uh, and I don't, and I'm, that's not all rainbows by any sure. means, um, but minimally, I think everyone, mo- most sane observers, would say. Well, minimally, if that calls you to uh, pay attention to the treaties where there are treaties mm-hmm. and, you know, r- revive the treaty making process where mm-hmm. there aren't treaties, you'll at least be going some way, you know, right, right, uh, right, to getting to that place. Right. And I've noticed that with a lot of big countries, also like the United States, I think the bigger the country, the harder it is for the government to manage such a large sort of piece of land, like you said, yeah. the different geographical locations and different needs of different um, areas where the population may be living as well. Uh, where smaller countries, like in Europe, um, they seem to be more happier. Like I think Finland yeah. uh, was yeah. the recently, was it the happiest country in the world or something? Or I mean, I uh, see it right on your yeah. face. I, yeah. <laughs> you've, you've inherited that. We were, well, I, we were in Finland a few years ago, and wow, it, amazing, so um, efficient, uh, very little conversation. Like, I mean, 
not empty conversation. Like when you ask a question, like you get the the answer. Yeah. And so that there's no follow up questions. It's like, oh, you answered everything that I needed to know. And then even my follow up questions. It's it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and of course, you know, great social safety nets and yes. so forth. Yeah. But it's interesting you were talking about the printing press and and the kind of how like how that changed things. Do you think that also changed the validity of truth? For example, mm. Uh, I published a newspaper, and I say this is the truth, uh, which beats your hearsay yeah. or what you're telling me through oral tradition, because now you can read it, and now everyone else can read this paper in mass quantities. Absolutely, and, and thank you for bringing that up, because that is another of the meanings of paper nation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Is that um, the, the the treaties on paper, as they are, you know, proposed and implemented. Uh, by the crown initially, uh, you know, England or France and then Canada, um, they claim a kind of truth, which until recently, mm-hmm. the the other version of the oral tradition that surrounds them uh, was basically dismissed entirely. Mm-hmm. And then now oral tradition is starting to be respected, you know, goes up to the right. Supreme Court and they right. go, yes, you actually have to pay attention to that. Right. Um, but... Uh, absolutely and 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 that you know that that claim to truth is one of the fundamental flaws with the paper nation and mm. the printed word mm. because it starts to gain a sort of authority you mm. say this is my constitution this is my book of laws this is my bible right right and it's like oh it's on paper Mm -hmm. like that's supposed to make it better right somehow and what begins to happen um is that that oral oral traditions culture life ways songs anything that doesn't make the transition to paper is now deprecated somehow Mm -hmm. right Right. like that is less authoritative you didn't cite your source Mm -hmm. or whatever you don't have a whole book that tracks this all the way back but you know and i know in an oral tradition if you attentively and respectfully repeat what was told to you in every generation it can be passed down mm-hmm. perfectly that's right you know you know you know by the that paper's long rotted by that that's point. right and, that's and, right. and that that <laughs> you know those tales are still being passed down and they that's contain right. truths and mm-hmm. and i think the other thing about the paper um, is that stories on paper come increasingly to, I don't know how to put this, but so I didn't really go here, but I think it's part of it, is that, is that they, they demand a literal, a factuality, mm-hmm. instead of a metaphorical or a symbolic embodied truth. Right. So you start any story that's told that, that doesn't look like it just lines up. You know, if you if if you say, um, well, our ancestors told us this, well, that starts to look very sketchy mm-hmm. for whatever reason, unless it's in the one book that's being right. <laughs> promoted that's above right, right. all, which is that's the right. Bible, right? <laughs> and and so there's this kind of privileging of the written word in that form. But then all others are kind of, you know, they become suspect. And mm-hmm. and I think the same is actually true uh, with regard to Islam as well, which is also very literary culture and, and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, has a holy book and so forth. Right, but right, I right. didn't look into that. Okay. So how do, you, how do you make the transition, or maybe it's an easy transition, from studying text and literature to singing and songwriting and playing music? Yeah, I mean, it's the same. I don't know. It's funny. I, I love that you mentioned that I, I, I played the open mic at the, um, at the Nawash powwow, which I just loved. Um, might have been the first open mic I played in oh, yeah. a long time. But um, Although you and I used to go to an open mic in the east end of Toronto at one time. Uh, that's right. Which the, one was the it? The Oasis uh, East, and then it became the Degrassi House. Was it the Degrassi House? It's like Queen. I totally and, forgot. It seemed like, a, that seemed long, like a whole, another lifetime ago. ago. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I, you know, I, how do I make the transition from writing to performing? It's not, they're different tools, but they're not different um, purposes in a way. You know, my, what I'm interested in is what are, first of all, what, what moves me? 
you know, um, how can the story be told to share what has moved me or mm -hmm. to share what I think is important? So when I was traveling in the high Arctic a lot with Adventure Canada, I started to get these really strong feelings around the tension between the received idea of North that broadly Southern settler Canadians were coming with and that my Inuit colleagues had inherited and were living. Mm -hmm. Two different Norths, and there they were, in the same place, allegedly. Right. What do you do with that, right? right. And it's the same kind of issue. Um, for me, my response to that was just on a gut level was I, uh, after a couple of years of that, because it took me a couple of years to find anything to say, um, but I started writing songs. And each song was a little story of a little place that had something in it that was meaningful. Mm. And that kind of explored this tension mm -hmm. like who do we think we are what what are mm -hmm. what is it that's motivating us and i have a you know largely southern canadian settler audience and i was singing the songs to them and they responded to that and that that was i think helpful for them in in demystifying and looking at their own positions on stuff that they had just received and weren't necessarily acting on mindfully mm -hmm. and I began collaborating with Inuit artists and global artists, and um, we looked at that and the and you know what a guitar and a microphone and a, the odd harmonica was a great way to approach that. I, I in my shows I show huge slides of images from mm -hmm. up there and places right. that I've been, and and so it's a it becomes this kind of immersive experience, and. I have been trying to think about how I could do that with like let's say this George Brown. Right. text and it doesn't really work i can't i can't it doesn't have this strong visual mm -hmm. element uh, you know there isn't this kind of romantic image of me bombing across the water right. in my zodiac sure <laughs> so but going at it as a writer allowed me to go to the same kind of depths and kind of shift things around in this kind of in the ideas place in the feelings place right. and and that you know that's i don't know writing music Right, photography, public speaking, they are all ways to do that for an audience. Right. So like you said, it's the goal is is the same, but it's different muscles that you're using, we'll say uh yeah, creative but, muscles. I mean, uh, you know, I, I see I see this, you know, you're doing a podcast right now. Uh you'll you release amazing videos, oh, you, you do live <laughs> concerts, you do uh albums, you know, and even the uh you know, then the the, the the whole apparatus around living as a public entity, you're having to use social media, all that. Well, aren't they just it's all? It's terrible. I, uh, just if I wasn't in, in this same... business, I'd never be on social media. It's, it's... <laughs> I know. It's, it's hard. It's hard, yeah. But I see those as all aspects of the same thing. Right. And, you know, I can appreciate why some people are simply guitar players mm -hmm. and some people are simply writers and you know, I get all that. Right. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just get distracted. But I, I seem to move from which to whichever one offers me a platform at the moment right. that's right, effective. Right. Because yeah. it seems like people like us, like we have something to say and uh, we'll find what whoever's got a microphone right? or a camera and we'll yeah. um, try to get our message across. across right. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that's yeah. taken some time for me to feel like un instinctively, I've always done that. I've always right. looked for the outlet. I don't know why. Right. You know, um, and then I then I went through the quite a phase of feeling insecure about that. Like, what is the matter with me that I always sure. have to be talking or writing or singing? Sure. <laughs> and now I'm just like, well, that's what I do. I don't that's know. What that's you do what I do. Now. Some yeah, people exactly. some people do other things. That's, that's the thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was listening to your record uh, Northbound that came out in uh, 2019. Did it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great album and Thank a you. song that really stuck out that I just finished listening to Muskox Stew. Yeah. Have you ever had Muskox Stew? I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't. What's it like? Please describe okay, it's, the. Uh, it's really good. And thanks for queuing into that song um i love that one because my friends linda and heidi are throat singing on it and, right and there's a we'll circle back to that because sure, i want to make sure, a point sure, about sure. that yeah, but yeah. um no it was inspired by um well many times when i would be on the ship with adventure canada we would kind of land in a place uh and the community would welcome us in and there's there's like 150 or 200 passengers and you know might be only a few hundred people in the community and you wind up in the gymnasium or the or the the community center or whatever have you and uh 
frequently the you know the community would put on some food ideally country food right mm -hmm. and of course this the ship would pay for that and what have sure, you but sure, sure. um so we had we tasted all kinds of things i mean i've eaten some really uh really good stuff and okay and some stuff that uh, you know it was a little harder for me seal brains for example oh, seal brain. okay yeah um but still, you know, you're honored to share that someone's sure, traditional absolutely. food, and you know, so I've had narwhal muktuk and you know, dried caribou and all these things. Mm. And, um, and one time we were in one of those uh, events, and um, a, a lady put a styrofoam bowl in front of me with this good-looking stew in it, and said, uh, "Muskox stew made for you." And I just literally took those words and, and started off the song, and I because I heard the. Da, 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 right. da, 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 da. So in that same community, um, I'd been traveling with Barney Bentall. He was, oh, Bar he, okay, yeah. he, you know, fellow musician. Mm -hmm. and he was on board the ship to do that, and um, we joined in with the band. There's a terrific band there, the Joa Band in Joa Haven, and, um, and Barney had his guitar, and I didn't have a guitar with me, but I wanted to play with the band too. So I, I had a bunch of shakers, and I just picked up all these shakers and I started shaking them. Well. <laughs> They they played a set that was like thirty minutes. Like, oh. <laughs> I had to, I'm gradually like dropping shakers out of my hand because I can feel myself getting tendonitis. And um, uh. but but what they're what they're doing it's all fiddle tunes, right? right and right. Um, and what I loved about that was those fiddle tunes were brought there by Scots whalers 150 years mm -hmm. ago, maybe mm -hmm. a long time ago. And they're alive and well. That tradition is alive and well. Right. And of course, the HBC was in these communities for sure. a long time, Hudson Bay Company, and it was always Scotsmen. Um, but that, see, here we are, a bunch of settlers from the south going to explore the north, right? Which which people have this conceit that it's like Canada, and that's mm -hmm. what makes us great, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow that idea is in people's minds. And they're looking to fall into the footsteps of the great explorers and all of this, most of whom were badly lost. And, and, That's right, and, yeah. and you know, some of them were pretty admirable, mm -hmm. no doubt. Some of them are not at all. And they're, they're problematic figures. And then here we are. We're welcomed into this space. And, and the, the circle gets extended around us, right? There's this huge welcome. And... Suddenly you're out on the floor square dancing. So there's a literal circle. And circles are really important mm -hmm. in indigenous culture broadly, in Inuit culture particularly. Mm -hmm. The drum is a circle. The sky mm -hmm. is a circle. The That's moon, right. the sun, all the things are circles. Right, everything. Life cycle, the, you name it. Right. The, <laughs> the snow house is a circle. That's you know. right, yes. And the community is a circle. And the elders and the children are in the center of it. And so when you... With the band goes up and this and suddenly it's a square dance and all the but this square dance it doesn't take place in a square it takes place in a circle right okay. right right and people are whirling around and whatever and the community are tremendous dancers but for me it was so moving that we southerners were going to the north looking for this kind of mystic vision and you know some of that's that desire is really authentic i don't mm -hmm deprecate that but what do you find your own tradition that's been lost in the communities mm. of the south mm. like you know my wife organizes square dances now where we live but it's to try to keep this thing alive right, right that right. when i was a kid was kind of everywhere and it's almost that's already right. gone did you take it in uh, high school gym class uh i did not but i remember that happening right, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but so here's this thing where like that's an authentic part of settler canadian mm. culture that's almost lost in the south and here mm. it's being given back mm. by these folks mm. in the far right north right i found that very profound so it's a big circle it's a really a big, big circle. circle oh yeah and it extends back to a time when there was a more egalitarian relationship the mm -hmm. railer the whalers would overwinter there there'd be trading back and forth and and you know that wasn't that wasn't an invasion it wasn't a colonization right, 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 it was right. people getting together and right. swapping traditions right. and I, I found that beautiful so that song then is is based on those rhythms um right and and it's kind of a way of saying like here how here's how we could think about entering that circle, mm. but and it's a tribute of course to Inuit generosity which mm -hmm. is profound, but I did want to, want to talk about the throat singing right, part because right, right, right. when I started writing these songs and and taking them on the road I 
I really believe in that saying, you know, nothing about us without us, right? And so I'm telling these stories that involve my Inuit colleagues and collaborators. And I just didn't want to, I mean, I had a little platform and I wanted to use it in a good way. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to be up there just right. me telling these stories. That kind of perpetuates the issue, right? Sure. Um, and so um, my friends, uh, Linda and Heidi, Sikinip Klauta, the, the, the uh, Sun's Drum is the English translation. They're a throat singing cultural performing duo based in Ottawa. Mm. And we just started doing these shows together. Wow. Um, and then I formed a band, a five piece band of amazing musicians. Some of them, you know, Saskia Tompkins mm -hmm. and Stefan Hannigan and the mm -hmm. gang and Oshin, Sam Allison. Um, and one of the things that I was puzzled about, there, there are a lot of people um, using throat singing in contemporary uh, Western music or uh, Western influenced music, European derived music. And it's tremendous. It's like it's it's profound, mm -hmm. and often one thing that happens, not always, but often one thing that that happens is the throat singing gets regularized. Right. And I didn't I didn't necessarily want to do that mm. um, because throat singing is really organic. It's a game between women. It's That's not right. originally a performance. And Linda and Heidi, who both learned it as adults and are sort of returning to their culture in that way. You know, they would sometimes speed up or slow down the rhythm, or the tones will shift by microtones or more. That's right. And that's cool. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to take that out of right. there and go, oh, I want you to accompany me. Right. I wanted us, like, what happens if we both do our thing? And so that's what we did. And, you know, they would, we would arrive at a rhythm that more or less uh, was workable right but if you if you listen to what happens in muskox stew on the recording which we did live uh they kind of start ahead of the beat and move through the beat and wind up behind it okay i was wondering right? about that that's right okay and but it kind of works right absolutely and, and and then it sort of blends in and it gives me shivers even now to think about it because i feel like sometimes when we do that song uh, like I feel others and entering oh, the room for sure, you know, and and coming around in that forming that circle, mm. um, just like it was up north when we would do those square dances and stuff. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So it seems like you have this this love and fascination of the north, and um, you've been with uh, like Adventure Canada, like you said, driving the Zodiac. That must yeah. be fun. Oh, driving the Zodiac uh, is so much fun. It must be fun. cold up there, of course. I mean, to be honest, I only ever went in the summer. In the and, summer, okay. And so it was cold sometimes. I mean, I've you know, I've I've literally driven a Zodiac as sea ice was forming around it, so that's oh, cold. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. But I've never been. I've never been any later than late September. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm not an Inuk. You know, right, I sure. haven't lived up there. Right. Um, and I always made those position statements pretty sure, clear sure but yeah driving a zodiac is a hoot man i mean i grew up like driving fun. boats on georgian bay and to, to that same joy of being right. out in a tin boat on georgian bay sure, is exactly the same absolutely you know 40 years later that's right so what's uh what's next for david newland other than becoming dr newland yeah. sometime in the future uh any other goals or aspirations that you want to accomplish ah. thanks for asking that because I'm in this midlife moment, right? And I'm so enjoying, I think I'm 53. Um, oh, okay. I mean, things get muddy in the pandemic, but I'm pretty sure I'm 53. That's right. No, I think I'm 52, <laughs> right, honey? Okay, here right. <laughs> um, and, and it's a moment that I'm really enjoying because uh, through much of my life, you know, I, would, I, I really had to deal with a lot of confidence issues. I had to work hard to establish good patterns for my mental health and my relationships mm -hmm. and all of that. And, and you know, I still work hard at those things, but I feel like, oh, I've got some momentum behind me mm. and I'm kind of confident about what I can do. I've, I've pulled a few things off. Eh? I pulled off the masters. I've pulled off a few albums, Northbound in particular, a lot of moving parts, right? Mm -hmm. 22 different musicians in a live space. That's I right. mean, there's a lot on the line as you know. And, um, and so, that has led me to wonder, okay, like what are my goals? Because I have this time left, and mm -hmm. um, I hope anyway. 
Uh, well, with modern medicine, I mean, who they knows? say someone today might live to be 150. Wow. So I'm not that sure could if be I, you. I'm not sure if I want to, but... <laughs> no, that means you'd have to work forever, too, right? Then, right? <laughs> yeah. And I haven't been putting enough aside to make that happen. <laughs> but uh, I have been thinking about that, though, because what I've noticed is in recent years, I don't seem to have been adding new goals the way I used to. Mm. And I've never been super goal-driven anyway, but I would have these visions right. of like, I feel like I really need to do that. Sure. And what I have been seeing, though, is some visions I had had earlier on have kind of stayed with me. You know, I got an Ontario Arts Council grant 10 years ago uh, to write a book that I never completed because mm. because the offer came up from Adventure Canada. and. So I completed my grant report. I'm all cool with the Ontario Arts Council, okay. but the book hasn't been published. Um, and there, you know, there are other books, probably three to four other books that okay. are still, I'm still writing them in the back of my mind as I go along right, and right, pieces right. will fall in place. And having written this master's, it sort of taught me to write a book and the PhD is going to be probably three or four times that long. So right, right, right. I think I might have some books. I don't know if I'll make another record. I do. The, another of my goals is to figure out the puzzle of what to do with all the songs I've written, hmm. because I have hundreds. Okay. Um, and you know, I used to say I was working on a box set. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this was before I'd made an album. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I still kind of think that's true. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, do I do like a kind of enhanced SoundCloud archive? Or do I just put a bunch of money together and put everything on, you know, vinyl, you know, something special. I don't want to release right. every song, but there are sure. songs I've written that are important to me that right. never saw the light of day. Okay. Um, so I'm, that's another possible goal. Uh, I'd like to keep working on my home. My family's really at the core of mm -hmm. everything. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we live in a place and we're trying to, really live in that place we're we're settlers we said we'd settle and uh, a lot of times people don't and, right and so and that, you're in Coburg yeah beautiful Coburg it is beautiful yeah. and and there's a lot of work to do there mm -hmm. you know I have my radio show and there you know my wife is very active in helping people who have really insecure housing right now and uh -huh. we are pollinator gardeners we've kind of mm. allowed our our yard to re-naturalize mm -hmm. as much as possible. And that actually takes a lot more work than it sounds sure. like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have ideas around, around that. Okay. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I know one thing, Mark, people used to say, follow your dreams. And I really believed that because I would have these cool dreams. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm wearing a backpack and going right. to India on a one way ticket. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I did those things. I lived right. in a bamboo hut in Costa Rica I built a cabin in Nova Scotia and lived in it without electricity and running water for a year and whatever. But I have seen that life has offered me things that are much better and more expansive and interesting than my little dreams. Mm -hmm. And so I've come to see follow your dreams is a, it's a naive sure. approach in some ways, you know? I think when people say that, they don't really know what they mean. Yeah, I think yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And yeah. it's op it open to interpretation as well. Well, because one of the things with dreams is dreams are symbolic. They're not literal, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Typically, they're not That's right. literal. That's so right. to make any meaning of your dreams usually involves some kind of work with the symbols and the metaphors. So does what does it mean to say follow your dreams? Like, are you actually meant to do this, this random thing that occurred to you? Or are you right. meant to think, what does that mean for me? That's what does right. that represent? And uh, it yeah, took me a long time to figure that that's out. That's right. So what would you say, um, we usually, uh, I usually ask, what sort of advice would you give to someone who's just kind of starting out? Mm. But I think I'm going to rephrase that question. If you, <laughs> if you could go back in time and give 20-year-old David Newland advice, and you're just starting out, out in life, what would it, what would it be? Mm. Not knowing, of course, what would come before, uh, what would happen in the future, of course. Boy. You know, uh, a former colleague of mine who's a real truth teller said something to me one time. Uh, he he was on a he was on a journey to deal with his addictions, and uh, it sometimes went better and sometimes went worse. But he he really ha was a truth teller, and 
in our relationship, I would often look at him as the one with the problem because I felt mm. like my problems were kind of behind me, right. which was very naive. And he said to me once, you are so much better and so much worse than you think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might say that to my 20 year old okay. self, well, there you, you know, go. because uh, because I think that guy was was not as confident with his gifts as he ought to have been. Right. And was way too confident um, in certain other areas. You know, I, I really, I really had to work on relationships and life right. management and, and all of that stuff. Right. Well, I think at that age too, we're big on ego and little on experience. And once those <laughs> yes. uh, two shift, then you know you start becoming more of a, I think, a productive sort of person. Yeah, I um, hope so. In society, hopefully, yes. Yeah. Not everyone, though, that happens to, but... Uh, I mean, purposeful anyway, right. you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and and I think, you know, sometimes I, I wind up in these kind of, like, mentorship situations. Um, I've been a mentor for, for, like, youth entering the artists program at at Folk Music Ontario, right. for example. And, and the, the th one thing I often say to those young people... There's two things I say, actually. So I might say these things to myself, too, back then. One is figure out whom or what you serve. And not you, but what what is it that you're about? And what, what could you serve with your gifts, right? right? Because if you don't figure that out, then you are in ego land. Mm -hmm. And you might have some really good impulses, but still... If they're not directed to that higher thing, it, you, 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 there could be a lot of wasted energy, to say the least. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And the second thing I would say goes back to to um, just the conversation around midlife is like, in our community anyway, I'm speaking very broadly of the, the Roots music community, you wanna be there, stick around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stick around. Absolutely. And see what happens. Because <laughs> I was never the flavor of the moment. I never got those high profile showcases. Right. You know, I, I never, um, you know, played the main stages at the big festivals or any, any of that stuff. But I've stuck around and, and good things have happened. Um, and I've been able to be a part of some good things. And, and that's a great feeling, you know. And that's, that's perfect advice. Uh, and we have a couple of minutes left. Any other last things you want to impart on us, wisdom or anything you're trying to plug? Do you have any shows coming up or? Other? You know, I'm in this moment where, okay. I mean, I'm doing a show today, but it's it's a private show. Okay. Um, and I've I've done a few little things, like a couple of weeks ago, Linda and Heidi and I actually performed at another private event for the Governor General, oh, Mary wow. Simon, which oh, was wow. kind of cool because she's <laughs> Inuk as well, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but no, I don't have I don't have public gigs on the calendar right now. People can listen to my radio show, Spirit of the Song, on Northumberland eighty nine seven dot ca. Okay, it's on uh, Thursday evenings at seven. We play your work lots. Oh, great! Thank you. And uh, um, and you can you you know you can get that on demand at at that website. But um, almost all my effort that uh, is is my family and my PhD right now. And, right. You know, I have students as well because I'm an I'm. Um, graduate uh, so I'm a seminar leader mm -hmm. for undergrad students mm. and that in itself is like this huge commitment and mm -hmm. it's a whole nother kind of audience right? right 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 yeah well that's great well thank you so much for coming to the show I always love talking to you David you always have well, you all too. these interesting things and stories to say and uh, we'll have you on the show again we should like do an extended sort of uh, long format where it feels like we could talk to you for like three or four hours <laughs> I know maybe I just... not that long but uh <laughs> I need to there. shut up at some point. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for uh, listening and watching.